Hi, I'm Joshua Reichert. I'm the resident scholar here at the Northeast Ohio C.S. Lewis Institute. At this time, I just want to introduce all of the CSLI staff members, if you haven't met them already. So Bruce Beard is the area director for Northeast Ohio. Bruce should stand up. Dan Osborne is the city director for Youngstown. And Beth Valentine is the fellows program coordinator. Beth worked very hard to put this event and many others together. So let's give her and the whole staff a It's my privilege to introduce to you tonight Dr. David C. Ward. Dr. Ward is a, an expert in Christian interdisciplinary studies. He's developed doctoral level coursework and also published in some of the leading journals on this topic. Uh, interdisciplinary studies is essentially bringing all of the other academic disciplines into dialogue with one another. So English and literature in dialogue with science and uh, mathematics and uh, the social sciences in particular. Dr. Ward has served on the staff of the Center for Christian Leadership at Dallas Theological Seminary. And he's currently a professor of faith learning integration at Oxford Graduate School in Dayton, Tennessee. In that capacity, he leads an annual trip every year to Oxford, England, where students do a short seminar on morality, law, and society. And they also participate in lectures from University of Oxford faculty. And he also leads an annual research trip to the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Dr. Ward's been giving talks on the Chronicles of Narnia for almost 20 years now. And uh, he's done this in church settings, in university settings, and as an educational consultant with uh, K-12 schools. So without further ado, it's my honor to introduce tonight Dr. David C. Ward. Thank you, Josh. It is uh, my extreme privilege and pleasure to be with you tonight. And uh, this is a topic near and dear to my heart because before I uh, ended up at a school of social research, uh, my first love was literature. I was a lit major as an undergraduate, and so I've always loved stories. And um, Tolkien and Lord of the Rings uh, and the Chronicles of Narnia were this been my staple. Uh, I can't even count how many times I've read it. So uh, my uh, experience over this last year with Dr. Riker has been functioning as a consultant with uh, his teachers at his school, dealing with something that was inspired by the Chron uh, Chronicles of Narnia called the Calling Chronicles. And I, I found as I was revisiting, preparing for this, that what I had been uh, doing with these teachers and the process that uh, had been transformative with the teachers over this year and that we are uh, using at uh, Oxford Graduate School <laughs> It's in the Chronicles of Narnia. And it was in the Chronicles of Narnia, and I was drawn to it before I realized where it came from. And it was coming back to it, and then I was like, wait a minute. And I, so I'm, I'm really excited, because you're the first people for me to share this with. Uh, and it's, yeah, I think it's very exciting. So uh, I would like to ask the Lord Jesus to lead us uh, on a quest to the realm where he has another name, Aslan. And so if we could uh, invite him to enchant us, take us into uh, the other realm of imagination where he's quite at work. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this opportunity tonight to be together and to uh, let C.S. Lewis lead us um, to know you a little better. And Aslan, I ask that you would open the door uh, to Narnia and let us in 
tonight. To take us to a place where uh, you can sneak past the watchful dragons of our latent unbelief that we don't fully realize is holding you back from all that you want to do in our lives and do a new and deeper thing. Because to know you, really, is to experience joy. And that's what we desire. To go farther up and farther in to your kingdom. So we invite you into uh, our hearts as you invite us into your quest of a calling chronicle. And uh, in Aslan's name, we ask this. Amen. Well, not attain God. How <coughs> readers, how we as readers can experience Aslan's calling chronicles in Narnia. How many of you have read all of the Chronicles of Narnia books? That will help me to see. Okay? Most of you have been through them before. That is helpful because I'm faced with the challenge of giving uh, an idea about seven books in an hour. <laughs> so that familiarity I'm going to build on and we're going to go right for the good stuff. So, these books, uh, Michael Ward, the author of Planet Narnia, which is causing, it's rocking the, the world of, of Lewisania with his book, Planet Narnia. And he has uh, said recently that more students of theology should read the Chronicles of Narnia to know what classical orthodox theology feels like from the inside. And he cited, that was, uh, he was citing Rowan Williams. Well, he, he uh, cites another scholar of uh, Lewis, who says that in the Chronicles of Narnia, Lewis reveals his personal religion more fully than any of his more formal works in theology. And uh, I have always found myself drawn to the Chronicles of Narnia because <laughs> Aslan felt more like Jesus that I have experienced than, than any other uh, Christian depiction <coughs> of Christ that I have ever read. And perhaps you have experienced that too. Well, there's a reason for it. And it has a lot to do with Lewis's own journey. He began his life telling stories with his brother Warney, and you may be familiar with this, but he grew up telling stories about talking animals and all this kind of stuff, and had faith as a young boy. But his mother died, and it hit him so hard that he lost his faith. And he was uh, really an atheist um, all the way through becoming an adult, experiencing the horrors of World War I, and then pursuing an academic career, and finally ending up at Oxford, where he became a tutor and a professor of medieval literature. So he became an expert on stories. But uh, it wasn't until J.R.R. Tolkien, his friend, <coughs> overcame a barrier, an intellectual barrier to belief that was as a result of modern thinking. He had been persuaded by uh, a scholar, The Golden Book, uh, by James Fraser, that made him think, hey, all these stories that have familiar themes about dying and rising gods and uh, in all the literature of the world, that they're really uh, there's nothing unique and distinctive uh, about Christianity with the myths that are out there and the parallels, the mythological elements that seem to be in uh, the Bible. But Tolkien said, Jack, myth 
became fact in Christianity. In all of these other stories of the world that have mythological elements, that is fallen man groping, like Paul talks about in Mars Hill in Acts 17, that God set the times and seasons of every nation under heaven that they might grope and perhaps find it. So in the myths of the world's folklore and fairy tales, it's fallen man groping after God and finding some gleams of truth mixed with error. But with Christianity and the, and the Bible, God is communicating to us and he's telling the grand story of history and it's got all of the fantastic supernatural elements that mythological stories do except it really happened myth became fact that so struck Lewis that it was the beginning of him becoming a Christian and uh, within a couple of months of that late night conversation he came to faith and so his his love of stories from literature and his reason that it kept him from faith were brought together. And that became a significant factor in his lifelong personal spiritual quest to pass along that faith to the world through his writings. So <clears throat> when he got to the stories and uh, began to write the Chronicles of Narnia, he wanted to steal past the watchful dragons of religion's stained glass associations and, and help children experience the power of Christianity before they knew that that's what they were receiving. And um, so this, as the stories came, they started with images and then he started writing and developing these stories. Well, what's interesting is that the order in which the stories were written and published is different than the order that exists inside of the stories. And in your notes, you'll see a comparison between the, those two different orders. And the order that I'm working with is the one that is consistent with the logic of the final complete series, which before uh, he died, he endorsed this rearrangement with um, by publishers where they, they, they no longer put uh, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe first, but uh, the Magician's Nephew. And the reason for this is because the stories actually have a logic to them. And we will get to that, but the order that we're looking at them is the Magician's Nephew, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, the Horse and His Boy, Prince Caspian, the Voyage of the Dawn Treader, the Silver Chair, and the Last Battle. And that actually corresponds to the scope of theology in order that the Bible really talks about. But <clears throat> to set up understanding the power of why these stories have the effect that they do, it's helpful to understand what Lewis uh, meant in uh, the differences and nuances that he makes between uh, allegory and myth. Because many people think that these books are allegorical and they're, they're not. He said that these are not allegories. There are some allegorical elements and there are mythic elements. Well, what is that difference? Well, allegory tends to have a single intellectually clear meaning. So, like in Pilgrim's Progress, the main character is called a Christian. And he goes, he gets stuck in the slough of despond. And the, the meaning is obvious, almost code direct, one to one. But in myth, it's operating at a much deeper level, and the there's multiple meanings, and it's functioning at the level of the imagination, not as clearly at the level of intellect so you, where you can directly tell what he's talking about. There are moments in the Chronicles of Narnia where it's really clear to the eyes of faith, oh, this is Christian. But most of the time, they're just great stories. And so the, the 
the biblical worldview, which is in them, is working on you at a much deeper level, at a broader level, much like uh, Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. And many people read Lord of the Rings and don't realize the underlying Christian mythos that underlies them. And Lewis basically said that, that what he was doing in the Chronicles of Narnia, he called a supposal. And he's saying, suppose Christ <coughs> incarnated in another alternate reality, what would that be like according to the laws of that world? And so that's what's going on. And so in a supposal, there are times in which it's mythical more broadly, but there are times when it will peak out and become allegorical and you realize that there's something Christian going on. But, uh, and it's all about the way he is getting at us. And he's, get, he's, he's getting at our imagination not our reason, like he does in his apologetics works. So, um, with that as a background, the mythic communication of these chronicles um, is based upon a concept of transposition. And Leanne Payne, in her book, uh, Real Presence, The Holy Spirit in the Works of C.S. Lewis, She's written an amazing book in which she talks about how uh, a key principle in Lewis's theory of literature had to do with how the greater uh, spiritual realities can come down and incarnate themselves in lesser ways, in lesser levels. And so it's that supremely seen in Christ's incarnation. But Lewis saw it at work in all of reality and that um, it could be tapped intentionally as an author to, to try to help that happen and work at a deep spiritual level so that uh, when people are reading his books, children, they don't necessarily have to know the Christian uh, elements underneath them, but because of that transposition going on behind the scenes and underneath, uh, experiences of the numinous, of the spiritual, of the transcendent can just burst out. And so many people have experienced that reading these books, and that's why um, Lewis is uh, he's working with I believe he's working with his views the Holy Spirit in, and using his creative process so my contention is that the power of these stories uh, just as he said with kids he was hoping to baptize their imagination before they got uh, exposed at the level of understanding when they started growing up to Christ and Christianity through church with all of its stained glass associations that they might not be drawn to. He wanted them to feel the power that was really there in Christ himself. And if that's true, then basically there's a process going on where there's an invitation to faith. And in the stories, Aslan is calling children out of our world into this other reality. And this other reality functions symbolically and metaphorically as a place where the spiritual, the fantastic, the supernatural for us uh, is much more commonplace and it's called magic. But uh, it's not an occult understanding of that at all. Well, that the mythic calling to a divine quest is a pattern that happens over and over in each of the stories. The characters that are called out of our world find themselves in Narnia not knowing necessarily why they're there, but they discover in the process that they, they got there as a result of being summoned. But they had to discover that that was the case. And the one who summoned them 
was calling them to two things, to know him and to get involved in a quest to do something to advance his will, his kingdom, in this world of Narnia. And uh, Oz Guinness, that's a great friend in C.S. Lewis Centers, he has written a tremendous book called The Call. And in it he talks about the primary call and the secondary call. The primary call is the call to know him. The secondary call is to, to contribute to Christ's kingdom in some way in the world that's related to who we are, our gifts and abilities, and our unique ability to make a contribution to advance the cause of Christ. And so it's interesting that that pattern that is a classic historic one in Christian theology recovered in the Reformation with the priesthood of all believers, that is present in a very powerful way with these children going into the world of Narnia. Well, my contention is if, if he was seeking to baptize the imagination of children through the stories so that when they came to uh, adult faith, they would welcome him, then he also said that a, a good children's story is good for adults. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, if you put those together, then, and, and people grow and develop through stages. In fact, faith grows in stages. Then it makes sense to me that the pattern going on in these stories has a built-in impact that Lewis may not have even intentionally planned, but the Lord did. And it's, I think, the reason why so many of us find ourselves beckoned and summoned in ways we can't put our finger on as we read these books. And it's, it's the phenomenon that I call the calling prophets. That we experience what it feels like to be called to know Christ and become a part of a quest to advance his kingdom. And we imaginatively experience it first and then in ways we're not always conscious of, we start drawing connections in our own lives in several ways. It's, I think, intentional. Well, <clears throat> there's a connection then between the what's going on in the progression of these stories. In a famous letter that he wrote to a little girl named uh, Anne, a uh, schoolgirl, I think she was uh, in America, and he, he answered so many letters, he wrote to her and said, the whole series, I've got that in here. Yes, works out like this. In The Magician's Nephew, uh, Narnia is about Narnia's creation. It's the book of Genesis of the series. And it talks about creation and how evil in it. In The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, it's basically the gospel about the crucifixion and the resurrection. The Horse and His Boy, which actually happens uh, during the tail end of the story of the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. It is about the calling and conversion of a heathen. In other words, it's a journey of a, ch a child to faith. Prince Caspian is about the restoration of true religion after corruption. In other words, it's the book of Judges, so to speak. Things have fallen away and a revival, revival happens. Aslan causes revival. The Voyage of the Dawn Treader is about the spiritual life. It's the pilgrim's progress of the series. And it's the lifelong journey and the trials of ups and downs of the spiritual journey. The Silver Chair is about the continuing battle with evil and darkness, the powers of darkness. And then finally, the last battle is the book of Revelation, if you will, about uh, the Antichrist coming to the world's end in the last judgment, and incidentally, heaven. So, that uh, progression is accomplishing something in readers as they move, as you move through them and identify with what's happening in the characters in their calling prompt. 
So <clears throat> the way that that happens is through what I have, think I have discovered uh, is a mythic plot pattern that enables uh, readers to encounter Christ through a hero's quest story. And this pattern is found in all seven books. And it can kind of help you read them more intelligently. So that pattern looks like this. This first stage is shows the history or background of what's going on in the world of Narnia at this point. We're introduced to the heroes, their challenges, and where they need to grow, and the hero's quest where they discover uh, what they're there for. Then in stage two, you have the hero's tests or adventures on the quest, and this develops the, the characters, but also the theological tension. So if these seven books work through a progression that parallels the biblical worldview, the story of the scriptures in, in a sense, then the heroes are moving through a hero's quest that's related to that progression. As, this, as each book moves forward. Okay? So this is, this is dis, dis, about discovering a logic that's up to something. And I, I don't think that Lewis consciously intended it to begin with. And I think my, my case for that would be the fact of looking at the order in which the books came to him. They didn't come in the order that they, they end up making sense of them. So, the Lord was in charge of the order that he received them. But once it was complete, uh, Lewis said when the last one was finished, the images related to it stopped. Mm -hmm. The muse became silent. In, in other words, the source of his inspiration was had finished. He had finished the work that he was meant to do through this series of books. And there were no more to be written, and he refused to even try to come up with another one because he knew it was done. So, in the third stage, there's a climax of the quest conflict. It changes the characters and reveals Aslan's intervention and solution. And then there's the consequences of the quest in stage four that resolves any unanswered questions and shows the fruit of the quest. And uh, if I could summarize it, it starts with a quest, leads to a test, the heroes are pressed, and they end up lost. <laughs> and that pattern follows all the way through each of the seven books. But the way that it does is profound the farther you go. Okay? And the way it is profound is consistent with the, bit, the Bible's own teaching that is increasingly more advanced. Okay? So what, what, what is Lewis's aim? To disciple us. It's about discipleship. And if I'm not mistaken, I think that's kind of the purpose of the C.S. Lewis Institute, right? <laughs> so we're we're uh, we're in the the center of the fairway tonight, just really uh, in a good place. Well, these uh, characters go through spiritual journeys, and each of them can be traced their growth and development and ours is related to the response to Aslan. So let's look. Let's start walking through and, and test this pattern. Okay? The Magician's Nephew is the book of beginnings. It has serves the mythic function of explaining the origins of things. So in stage one, the heroes, uh, Diggory and Polly, um, end up discovering Narnia. Um, and it's, it's not really Narnia at first they end up, but they get out of this world as a result of being deceived by 
uh, Diggory's Uncle Andrew, who is dabbling in the occult through some magic rings. And, and he's too cowardly to experiment himself, so he tricks them into going out of this world and into another. And so that sets up the Christian problem of evil when power and choices are divorced from moral accountability. Because Uncle Andrew thinks he is, because of his uh, advanced research, that he's above good and evil. That's, that's for the little people. But he's elite and therefore beyond moral accountability and choice. And that is a dangerous, dangerous place in Lewis's mind. He saw, Lewis, I think, prophetically saw that happening in uh, the culture of his time. I would say it's even more so now. So, uh, in the second stage, they end up in this uh, alternate reality of charm, a dead world. And they discover this uh, people that seem to be suspended in time and one of them is a beautiful woman that looks regal and royal and there is a riddle and a bell and a hammer and Diggory is tempted by the riddle even though his friend Jill is very cautious something's wrong because there aren't even any insects around here something bad has happened we should, we need to just get out of here. And he cannot resist the temptation. Rings the bell, awakens the witch, and the trouble begins. So, this Queen Jadis finds a way back through them to England and immediately decides she's going to take over that world. And out of Terror. The children say, we've got to do something about this. So in, in using the magic rings again, in a conflict situation, they transport her back out of this world, and they end up in this uh, wood between the worlds, this portal area between worlds, and they end up going into this other world, Narnia, at the moment of its creation. And they discover, not knowing who the Creator is, this lion singing this world into existence. It's an incredible, ethereal, beautiful uh, way of depicting the power of Aslan as Creator. And the, it's, a, it's an incredible uh, scene. Probably the high point of the whole book is the way in which all these animals come up out of the ground and surround Aslan and he gives them the power of speech and sets the rules of their existence in place so he establishes a moral law and accountability that comes in, out later in the series. Well, um, the whole thing then leads to uh, a battle with between this witch and Aslan. And the witch, who's transported with him, has taken...